let me put this into uh, perspective for you. Polyneuropathy, many nerves that are being affected. It all comes under the organization of peripheral neuropathy. And if you go back to a particular schematic that I showed you of uh, the spinal cord, and from the spinal cord, you had your anterior horns, and you had the motor, and then as you passed through your motor, you made your way out into periphery, you had peripheral neuropathies, and that's basically where we are. And then with peripheral neuropathy, we talked about mononeuropathy, went through individual nerve injuries, went through mononeuropathy multiplex or mononeuritis multiplex, where you have one nerve in multiple locations that are being injured. And the biggest section of it all would be polyneuropathy to begin. Differential diagnosis of peripheral polyneuropathy include the following, immune-mediated, metabolic issues, hereditary, toxic, infectious. We'll be spending a lot of time with a lot of these differentials. If it's immune-mediated, and we'll slow down here, make sure that you're very, very clear how to identify Guillain-Barre, you've heard before. This is Guillain-Barre is an acute type of inflammatory and demyelinating polyneuropathy. Hopefully you know that. If you haven't, please understand that Guillain-Barre is an acute inflammatory, considered to be inflammatory, and demyelinating type of polyneuropathy. Once we've discussed our AIDP, we will then go on to what's on a CIDP. Instead of acute, it'll be chronic inflammatory, demyelinating polyneuropathy. We'll walk through multifocal motor neuropathies, perineoplastic and associated monoclonal gammopathies, vasculitic type of neuropathy, and associated with other autoimmune diseases. Let's take a look at Guillain-Barre, aka acute inflammatory and demyelinating polyneuropathy. You must understand that you may have many infections that predispose this patient, such as gastroenteritis, maybe even influenza virus. And then thereafter, the pattern of uh, demyelination would be an ascending paralysis. Now, not as benign as one would think, because if it ascends enough, what are you going to hit at some point in time? Your breathing apparatus, in other words, the diaphragm. And if that's been knocked out, your patient is in serious compromise. There's absent reflex, even before full weakness, and often have low back pain early, can result in respiratory failure because, as I said, as you ascend, at some point in time, you are at risk of injuring your diaphragm. Monitor your FVC closely. What does that mean to you? You've heard a pulmonary function test, and so therefore, you want to make sure, if you're suspecting Guillain-Barre, to make sure that uh, the respiratory system is not being compromised with the, with the um, diaphragm. Intubate if less than 15 milliliters per kilogram. That's important. Let's diagnose Guillain-Barre. On CSF, it shows an elevated protein. That, of course, is nonspecific. Demyelinating features, what does that mean to you? When you do a nerve conduction test, it is going to come back to be abnormal, not specific. You would find that with Lou Gehrig as well. And raised protein with absence of WBCs. Just keep in mind, your clinical history becomes the most important component of Guillain-Barre. Was there a prior infection? Was it an ascending type of paralysis? And, and, is your patient in a state of respiratory compromise? Acute inflammatory. IVIG or plasmapheresis would be management, and steroids are not at all useful in acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, the opposite of Guillain-Barre syndrome. But chronic, mean to say slowly progressing weakness, often involves neck flexors. Chronic relapsing course, a reflexia common, may have loss of vibration sense as well. Diagnosis, once again, elevated protein CSF, it is going to be nonspecific. Demyelinating, your nerve conduction test will be abnormal and raised protein with absence of WBCs. Management here, steroids are effective, whereas an acute inflammatory, it's not. IVIG also useful. What's IVIG? Intravenous immunoglobulin. Management required for many years. Chronic inflammatory. 
Here we'll take a look at multifocal motor neuropathy. What are clinical features here? Slowly evolving, asymmetric weakness is in individual nerve distribution. Multifocal motor neuropathy. Usually more prominent in the arms. Weakness out of proportion to atrophy. This then tells you that this is more of a nerve issue. Is that clear? The weakness is out of proportion to atrophy. Sparing of the sensory nerves, strictly motor neuropathy. Diagnosis, motor nerve conduction block on nerve conduction study. So you're looking for motor. Positive anti-GM1 antibody in approximately 60 to 80% of your patients. Guess what? You're memorizing this. GM1 antibodies. Management, IVIG, and perhaps immunosuppressive therapy is required. Cause of metabolic neuropathy. Diabetes is always on top of that list, as is thyroid disease. Hepatic failure, your kidneys failing, uremic neuropathy. That's an important one. At the end of this entire section, I'm going to walk you through a very, very important, what I call a polyneuropathy nirvana diagram, as we shall see. Porphyritic neuropathy. What does that mean? You, you know about your, in biochemistry. You should know about your porphyria pathway on your way to produce your heme. And in that porphyria pathway, there are a couple of um, diseases or biochemical pathologies that you should be familiar with, one of them being acute intermittent porphyria. Vitamin deficiencies, either B1, B6, or B12. Once again, remember B1, that's the problem. Thymine, B6, required for, once again, proper myelination, and of course, B12. Critical care neuropathy. These are metabolic neuropathies, important etiologies. Let's quickly walk through diabetic neuropathy. Chronic, progressive, distal, symmetric, diabetic polyneuropathy. Every single word there, incredibly important. Diabetes in the U.S., type 2 diabetes, of course, extremely common. Chronicity, decades have gone by. And now at this point, you're going to have symmetric and distal neuropathy taking place. We call this stock and glove, don't we? Most common presentation, small and large fiber involvement. There is no discrimination with diabetic neuropathy. It affects you everywhere. Neuropath neuro neuropathic pain is usually prominent. Uh, for example, what about the nerves in the stomach? Would they be lost? Oh, absolutely. So you have paralysis of the stomach. We call this gastroparesis. Or maybe your patient has suffered a myocardial infarction and there was no chest pain, a silent myocardial infarction. Nerves have been lost. Or down in the feet. And here, once again, the nerves. You're worried about decubitus ulcers, aren't you? The diabetic neuropathy, small, large fibers. Neuropathic pain, usually prominent if you're actually wondering about what's happening to your nerves. Clinical features. Initial symptoms are severe thigh and back pain with diabetic neuropathy. And uh, with diabetic proximal motor neuropathy is what we're referring to specifically, or diabetic what's known as amyotrophy, followed by hip and thigh muscle weakness and atrophy. So you begin initially with thigh and back pain, and then followed by hip and thigh muscle weakness and atrophy. You put all this together and you call it amyotrophy, proximal motor. We have the diabetic proximal motor neuropathy, continuing with our discussion. Acute axonal diabetic polyneuropathy. And then, with diabetes, remember, there's no discrimination here. And by that, I mean, you could have diabetic mononeuropathy. What's that mean? You could have one nerve that is being affected. Maybe radial nerve, maybe the ulnar nerve, maybe the median nerve, maybe the common peroneal nerve. You could have the nerves coming out of the spinal cord, radiculopathy polyradiculopathy, compression neuropathy, all are significantly much more common in patients that are diabetic. Every single nerve, just about, in a patient with diabetes, over a long period of time, if not properly managed, is at risk for injury. Plain and simple, to a pathologist maybe, to a doctor possibly, but for the patient, it's a lot of education, isn't it? Management, well, the most important thing is going to be glycemic control. 
That's your best measure of treatment. And by this, we mean what? Lifestyle modification, lose weight, watch your diet. And why do I roll my eyes when I do that? Because you know, if you've done your rotations or those of you that are practicing, it's easier said than done. The symptomatic management. Well, now if you're actually getting into diabetic neuropathy and need to uh, treat the symptoms, tricyclic antidepressants, anti-epileptics, especially uh, carbamazepine and perhaps gabapentin. Remember carbamazepine? It was actually uh, uh, a first-line drug for trigeminal neurology. So we know that carbamazepine definitely helps out with people that have neuropathies. Tramadol, opioids, maybe perhaps because of refractory cases, that pain is actually intolerable sometimes. And ah, this is a deadly road, isn't it? The opioid, a uh, huge discussion in behavioral science. And NSAIDs for entrapment neuropathies as well. <music>